All right, uh, it's 202 now. I think we can get started. So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to Ask Simna series. Uh, this is Zhang. I'm the Simna coordinator, and I will be today's moderator together with our communication specialist, um, Kathy. And um, it's very exci exciting that this one is our last one of this um, semester, and also the last one with um, WebEx. Um, just so you know, then the um, seminar is being recorded, and the video will um, be later um, published on our YouTube channel. And you are um, please feel free to check it out. And after the um, speaker's presentation, please feel free to bring up any questions. You can either um, unmute yourself, um, or you can chat us a question, and we will read it out. Loud. And so um, before we uh, go ahead, so our communication specialist, um, Kathy, um, has a few words to say about the um, plan moving forward. So Kathy, please go ahead. Yeah, so thank you everyone for attending our seminars this semester. As John said, this is the last one of this semester. Um, the semester ends like in a week, so it's really, we'll definitely have semesters or um, seminars over the summer. They'll just be not in our usual schedule, but this is your time um, to give us feedback on anything that you liked or disliked this semester or otherwise, if you have any ideas, suggestions, like John said, we will be switching to Zoom um, moving forward. The license, the UMD's license and for Zoom, or I'm sorry, for WebEx ends very soon. Um, we are also talking about changing things like the time, like the time of the week or the time of the day. So if you have any feedback on that, please give it to us. I just put the link um, of the form in the chat, but it's go.umd.edu slash seminar feedback, one word. And this will be in an email too, and it's also in the chat. Um, but okay, that's all I have to say. So Ralph, take it away. Please introduce our speaker. Okay, yes, and I'll try to be brief. Um, so you welcome our speaker, uh, Professor Kelly Lombardo, who's a professor at um, the Department of Meteorology at Penn State. She got her degrees um, at um, State University of New York at Albany, and then uh, her PhD at Stony Brook. And uh, she's a, a specialist in um, mesoscale convective uh, complexes and severe weather. Um, she's received a number of um, early uh, scientist career awards and serves on um, a few uh, important committees and panels and is also um, an editor for uh, weather and forecasting. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Kelly for her talk. Uh, it's a good, it's a time of year where we get these MCSs, so it's, a, it's good timing for the talk. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much again for inviting me to speak at such a prestigious seminar series. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about mesoscale convective system behavior uh, as they move over our coastlines. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge my current postdoc, Fan Wu, and a former master's student, Tristan Kading, uh, who contributed to this work. Oh, am I not moving forward? All right, there we go. So my group looks at the impact of surface and lower tropospheric heterogeneities on organized deep convective storms, specifically mesoscale convective systems. So I'll be referring to them as MCSs. Some people call them squall lines. Some people call them quasi-linear convective systems or QLCSs. So they have a bunch of different names. Um, but our focus is largely on the coastal zone. And specifically, we're interested in the behavior of MCSs as they move from these inland regions to the offshore. And so MCSs occur over a number of coastal regions globally um, with variability in topography along these coastlines. So just taking an example, the Appalachian Mountains, if we look more closely, we can notice that the Appalachians are right up against the coastline, sort of in the northern seaboard and displaced much further inland in the south, leaving the coast next to a coastal plain rather than coastal orography. And so we seek to understand the response of MCSs um, to sea breezes that are moving onshore to flat coastal plains and sea breezes that are moving onshore into coastal mountains. And so as MCSs move from inland regions towards the coast and potentially offshore and encounter sea breezes, there are interesting changes that can occur in storm dynamics, storm evolution, 
the lifetime, the intensity of the storm, and then of course, coastal precipitation. Um, and so just to give you a couple of examples of evolutions, um, this is a radar reflectivity animation of a storm moving uh, from inland regions to offshore over the northeastern US. And notice that as the storm moves across essentially the New Jersey coastline, it ends up decaying. So that's one evolution these storms can undergo. Storms can actually also intensify at the coast. So again, if we look at New Jersey, notice there's this blow up of convection as the storm basically hits the coastline. Uh, storms can actually also, oh no, ah, this is that's such a good one. And occasionally this stops when I have my my uh, my uh, presentation up for too long. Um, so maybe we can come back to this at the end so I don't mess up the presentation. But um, we can also have something called uh, a proper uh, discrete propagation. And so that's actually when we get these individual cells that form out ahead of our main convective line. They actually grow upscale into the new MCS. Um, and that MCS then moves towards the coastline. Um, so essentially what happens is the storm jumps forward, which means that the hazards are gonna arrive sooner than we expect just from the translational speed alone. And so understanding which one of these evolutions occur is actually important then obviously for um, predictions of uh, the associated hazards. And so these storms can produce many. Um, they can produce flooding, flash flooding. They can produce small hail high winds, frequent lightning, and occasionally we do get tornadoes and water spouts associated with MCSs. And since population is typically clustered at coastlines, these are obviously high impact events. And so today I'm gonna to be focusing on one primary society, societally relevant result, and that's the coastal precipitation maximum. So as inland storms move towards the coast, there can be an increase in precipitation either before or while the storm is encountering the sea breeze. And so some questions arise, right? So what conditions um, will we see a coastal precipitation maximum occur? When will it arrive? Will it be before it encounters the sea breeze or while? What are the physical processes driving um, this coastal precipitation maximum? And understanding the answers to these questions is important for hazard prediction. And so different processes, different physical processes can cause this coastal precip max. And it depends on the base state environment. So, you know, kinematic and thermodynamic conditions. And it actually depends on if the coastline is flat or if it's mountainous. And so I wanna start by taking a step back and just thinking about some fundamental MCS dynamics before we start thinking about how the coast basically can mess them up. And so MCSs are self-organizing multicellular, which is the important part, deep convective storms. So they're sustained through the continued generation of individual convective cells, at least isolated convective cells, on a preferred flank of the storm, which is usually determined by the environment vertical wind shear. And so we get the evaporation of storm precipitation. It actually generates these downdrafts. Downdrafts then reach the surface and spread out as a surface-based cold pool, which is known sometimes as thunderstorm outflow, which is known also as a gust front. So I'll be referring to it as a gust front through the talk as well. And so as this cold pool moves out with the MCS, that is actually what provides the lift to initiate cells um, ahead of the MCS and have the storm propagate forward. So this CI, this convective initiation is important. In fact, it's critical for the maintenance of these MCS storms. And so today I'm gonna focus on how uh, sea breezes and coastal mountains impact this CI, MCS evolution, and then our coastal precipitation. And so, how can sea breezes and coastal mountains impact MCS convective initiation and coastal precipitation? Um, well, all MCSs, not just coastal MCSs, but all MCSs can decrease their near storm environment stability. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, here we have a um, MCS schematic cross section, similar to what we have before, which I forgot to mention. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, so it shows a storm moving from left to right. This is, um, an anvil, uh, the overshooting um, and anvil of the storm. And so precipitation can actually fall out from the forward anvil of the MCS. And we see the same thing in this image of an anvil with the precipitation falling out. And so as this rain falls, um, we can actually get evaporative cooling underneath the MCS anvil, and that can actually decrease the lower tropospheric conditional stability just ahead of the storm. And so this is a cross section from a 3D idealized simulation of a coastal MCS. And so the shading is a, a equivalent potential temperature, saturation equivalent potential temperature, so theta ES. The contours are uh, just a U wind. 
the um, the black hunters, I should say, the green is actually the outline of the MCS. So that's the MCS precipitation mixing ratio. And then the blue contours show negative buoyancy and that actually marks our sea breeze. And so as we look towards the MCS, notice that the theta ES actually decreases in association with this evaporative cooling. We actually are also have um, a buoyancy minimum showing up as a reflection of this cooling as well. And so obviously we have a decrease in our conditional um, instability in front of the storm. And this reduction in instability is gonna be favorable for that CI associated with MCS propagation. So storms can actually decrease their stability in a number of different ways. So that's one way. Another way is related to storm generated gravity waves. So deep convective storms can actually generate gravity waves. And here is um, an animation from an idealized buoyant updraft set off at the, in the middle of the domain. Um, it's initiated through a warm bubble. Uh, we have buoyancy that is shaded, so positive is in red, negative is in blue, and then we have vertical motion that is contoured, so positive is solid and negative is dashed. So we see this uh, convective plume go up in the middle, similar to what we have as an MCS, um, and then we see these gravity waves radi radiating away. And so deep convective storms can actually generate gravity waves of different frequencies. And one of those waves are called low frequency gravity waves. And they're actually generated in response to storm latent heating serving as a broad heat source. And so this uh, schematic cross section um, down below actually so shows a cross section of this, you know, quote, N equals two wave. And with these waves, we usually have either descending motion in the upper troposphere and ascending in the lower or vice versa. But if we have uh, the branch where we have ascending motion in the lower troposphere, this lower tropospheric lift can actually temporarily cool the mid-levels and therefore it decreases the lower tropospheric status, static stability as well. So that's another source that MCS is or ways that an MCS can destabilize its surrounding environment. And so what does this have to do then with sea breezes? Well, as a storm approaches the coast, the onshore moving sea breeze can move you know, near the storm and into this area of reduced static stability, and we can actually get convective initiation ahead of um, the MCS by the sea breeze. So this is actually an additional source of CI ahead of the main gust front. And this is gonna impact our MCS evolution, the lifetime, and then obviously our coastal precipitation patterns. Um, so I said MCSs can generate gravity waves of, you know, a number of different frequencies. So some are low, some are actually high frequency gravity waves, and they're actually generated in response to fluctuations in storm latent heating. And so this is just a snapshot from the um, animation that I showed earlier. And you can see the descending and the ascending patterns associated with basically the buoyant updraft or, you know, considering an MCS updraft in the center. There we go. And so if we have the right conditions, these waves can actually be trapped in the troposphere and they can propagate well ahead of the MCS and the MCS cold pool. Well, sea breezes actually can also generate gravity waves as they move you know, onshore. And so this is a cross section again from a 3D simulation of an onshore moving sea breeze, which is shaded here. The buoyancy associated with the sea breeze is shaded in blue um, and an offshore moving MCS. So again, the precipitation mixing ratio associated with the MCS is um, contoured and shaded in green. And so notice that we have, you know, this is the front of the sea breeze. We have ascending motion in blue, descending motion in red, and out in front, kind of this Neapolitan ice cream looking thing, our passive tracers we released out ahead of the sea breeze. And notice that as soon as the sea breeze moves close, it lifts them and then it descends and then it lifts them and then they descend. And so you get this oscillating pattern in these passive tracers associated with the gravity waves. However, the high frequency gravity waves from the MCS as they move towards the sea breeze can actually interact with those generated from the sea breeze. Um, and from that, you can actually get CI ahead of the MCS and ahead of the cold pool. And so basically you end up getting this deep tropospheric lift through the interaction of these two sets of gravity waves. So again, we have an additional source of CI ahead of the gust front, changes in MCS evolution, lifetime, and then coastal precipitation patterns as well. And just notice actually we get CI, it seems like over um, the sea breeze or you know, the marine layer itself. And again, remember we have an area of reduced static stability around the storm, which is even more favorable for CI as well and associated with this, with this deep lift through the combined influence of both gravity waves. Um, so offshore moving MCS cold pools can also collide with the onshore moving sea breezes. And the collision between these two density currents actually results in enhanced convergence 
at the guest front. And this can actually be supportive of enhanced ascent of air parcels at that gust front, and therefore MCSVI, important for MCS maintenance, and then obviously the intense precipitation. Um, interestingly, which we won't get into today, it's kind of a feedback cycle though, right? If we have changes in MCS ascent, precipitation, um, that in turn is gonna impact our cold pool, which again is gonna end up impacting ascent and precipitation. Um, so as the gust front and the sea breeze meet one another, we can get this enhanced ascent, but also the density gradient across the gust front decreases. And so this actually impacts the trajectory of air parcels rising up um, after they are basically lifted by the gust front through this convergence. This impacts updraft slope, it impacts updraft intensity, and therefore it's going to impact the, the intensity of the storm, the maintenance of the storm, and obviously then the precipitation. All right, so that's all at the coast. What about just mountains, just inland mountains? Well, the sloping surfaces of mountains can actually modify our storms as well. And so cold pool characteristics, specifically the depth and the buoyancy can actually change as the storms move up and down the mountain slopes. And so as storms move upslope, cold pools typically deepen and become denser as MCSs ascend the mountain slopes. And this is due to essentially gravitational deceleration of that dense air um, and increases in precipitation associated with orographic lifts. So we end up deepening the cold pool. Uh, however, on the downslope, our cold pools actually become shallower and less dense due to gravitational acceleration and adiabatic warming. And then once we get to the flat plains on the bottom, the cold pools deepen um, and become denser at the mountain base. And so these changes in cold pool characteristics are going to obviously impact gust front ascent, MCSCI success, maintenance, and precipitation. Um, and this is just an example from uh, 3D, our uh, idealized um, 3D simulations of an MCS moving over a mountain. And so we have both cross sections and plan views of precipitation mixing ratio. And so the first panel shows the MCS being very strong and mature over essentially the mountain or the plateau top. As the cold pool starts to descend the slope, notice that the storm is weakening. Um, it continues to do so as the cold pool basically makes it to the bottom. And once it makes it to the bottom, you see this new CI happen at the mountain base. This ends up growing upscale and becomes the new MCS that propagates away from the, from the mountainside uh, successfully. Um, and just one final point, um, obviously the thermodynamic and kinematic conditions at the top of the mountain are gonna be different from that at the bottom. And as the storm moves up and down and encounters these different environments, it's gonna respond to that as well. So for storms at the coast, um, you know, moving over coastal mountains um, and encountering a sea breeze, all these factors actually need to be considered. And the combined influence of a sloping mountain surface and a sea breeze actually yields different results than the storm behavior for the storm response to each feature um, alone. And so we seek to understand the physical processes driving coastal MCS behavior. We wanna identify the supporting environments. Um, we're looking to identify robust similarities and differences that occur across a broad range of environments. So you know, thermodynamic kinematic conditions, a broad range of sea breezes um, and a broad range of mountain characteristics. But obviously there's a lot of complexities. So how do we manage these? I've already shown a few examples, but we manage these through idealized numerical experiments. And so we're isolating the impact of a parameter space of sea breezes mountain, thermodynamic, and wind vertical profile characteristics on coastal MCS behavior and coastal precipitation. And so we use the NCAR Cloud Model 1. We've performed simulations in both 2 and 3D. Um, our horizontal resolution is 200 meters. Our vertical grid is uh, 50 meters in the lowest three kilometers, stretched to 250 at the top. Uh, and so far, we've used two different environments to initialize our idealized simulation. We've used this mid-latitude environment or mid-Atlantic environment, and it's based on observed profiles that support coastal mid-Atlantic MCSs. Um, and then we also used um, a long-lived environment. And this is actually a classic, um, a classic sounding profile that's used through much of the literature on, um, on MCSs. And it's really designed to support long-lived um, mid-latitude MCSs. So actually in a simulation, it means that you can study the storm as it moves across essentially the entire domain and, not, and does not necessarily decay. All right, so let's think about first just the sea breeze only experiments that we've performed. So for these, our sea breezes are initiated as a cold block of negative potential temperature perturbation on the right side of the domain. 
Um, and this actually allows for control of the depth of the marine layer and the thermal perturbation that's going to be driving the sea breeze. Um, we do use other sea breeze initiation methods, um, but I'll talk about those later. And so convection is initiated on the right side of the domain using momentum forcing, and then the storm and the cold pool move towards the sea breeze as the sea breeze moves towards the storm and the cold pool. Um, so for these sea breeze only experiments, we have used um, both of those profiles, both the long lived and the mid Atlantic. We've even used a number of different um, potential temperature perturbations for our marine layer and a number of different depths. And these values are actually all constrained by observations. Okay, so first I wanna talk about the mid-Atlantic storm simulations that we've performed. And so these are precipitation mixing ratio plan views. So basically we're looking down on it, almost like you're looking at a radar image. And so for two snapshot times, so in the upper left panel, at this time, the storm and the sea breeze are close to one another. Um, but the cold pool and the sea breeze have not collided at this time. But notice there's this field of isolated cells that form out ahead of the main convective line um, and essentially over the sea breeze. And actually, this is the interesting animation from the beginning that I couldn't show because it ended up pausing. So I apologize for that. Um, and in the next panel, these cells actually organize linearly and become the new leading edge of the storm. Um, and so this is what's known as the discrete propagation or the jump forward. Um, and essentially the hazards arrive sooner than anticipated from the translational speed alone. Um, and I do wanna mention that no CI actually occurred when the MCS and Seabreeze were far from one another, only when the MCS and Seabreeze became close. And so this ends up in uh, an increase in precipitation before the Seabreeze and the MCS actually meet. And so this is a time series of total mass of rain in the domain. This is for all the experiments that we performed. Um, and so the control is in the black. Um, sim simulations with a deeper marine layer where sea breeze are in the solid. Simulations with a more shallow marine layer where sea breeze are in the dashed. Uh, simulations that we use, you know, a lower potential temperature perturbation are in blue and a less, you know, not quite so low potential temperature perturbation are in red. And so this gray line actually marks the approximate collision time between the cold pool and the um, and the sea breeze. And notice that there's this peak in precipitation about 20 to 30 minutes prior to the collision. Um, and we see this for all, um, all simulations, so all sea breezes. Uh, but notice it actually is greatest for the deepest and coldest um, marine layer that we use. And so we do see this type of evolution occur in our, you know, this long lived quote environment. So again, this is um, cross sections now instead of planned views, but cross sections of MCSs about, but not quite interacting with the sea breeze for um, progressively colder and then progressively deeper um, marine atmospheric boundary layers. Um, and notice that we do get CI um, and we do get a discrete propagation, but only for storms encountering the deepest sea breeze. So the thousand meter deep sea breeze that we use in these particular experiments. And so what processes drive the discrete propagation in each environment and why does it only occur for a subset of the long lived storms, but it occurs for all of our mid Atlantic storms. Well, the propagation physics is actually sensitive to the environment. So let's think about these long lived storms, the ones that we just looked at. And so initially the sea breezes were too shallow to lift parcels to their base state level of free convection. Um, so as it moved, you know, across the environment, the LFC was just too high. It was about 1.8 meters. But as the storm and the sea breeze approached one another, you know, a subset of those sea breeze, sea breezes, the deepest ones, were actually deep enough to lift parcels to a lower LFC in a storm modified environment. So the storm reduced the surrounding static stability, lowered the level of free convection to something, you know, below 900 meters. And so when the sea breeze got into this environment, it was able to initiate convective cells which then influenced the evolution of our storm. And we got that jump. So what about our mid-Atlantic environment? Um, well, actually CI that we saw there um, was not actually due to a lowering of the level of free convection. The height actually didn't really change much. This was actually due to that constructive interference between the gravity waves generated by the storm and the gravity's gener gravity waves generated by the sea breeze front within an environment of reduced um, static stability by the storm itself. And in this case, all the sea breezes actually ended up supporting um, convective initiation. And then we got that discrete propagation and that jump. Okay, so those were just the sea breeze experiments. What happens when we actually add a coastal mountain? And so for these experiments, we use um, a plateau on the left side of the domain of differing heights. Um, and then we have a slope 
that leads down to the ocean surface. And this is the simplification of coastal terrain, um, but it's a generally a commonly observed structure. Um, so like I said, we use three different plateau heights, but I'm gonna just be talking about kind of our middle range plateau height um, today. So we use 1.5 kilometers. And again, this is initialized with that mid-Atlantic thermodynamic and kinematic environment. So we're using the same initial conditions that we use for those um, 3D um, sea breeze only experiments that, uh, that I just mentioned. And so again, we initially uh, initiate the sea breeze using a cold block. So we use a number of different uh, potential temperature perturbations and a number of different marine layer depths, again, constrained by observations. And so the marine layer is then allowed to move towards the mountain slope as a sea breeze. And so this is a cross-section animation of our storm that is over the plateau top, starts descending down towards sea level and interacts with our sea breeze. And um, notice that as the storm moves down this slope, no discrete propagation actually occurs when we include the coastal mountains, even though we have the same environment. And so there's no discrete propagation, but we actually still see a coastal precipitation maximum over the mountain slope. And this is actually due to the collision between the MCS cold pool and the sea breeze front um, as the two interact over the slope. And so these are time series for maximum vertical motion, total precipitation mass, and rain rate for all of the experiments that we performed using um, this mid-Atlantic environment in 2D. Uh, and this uh, red line here marks the range of cold pool sea breeze collision time. So at this time, the cold pool and the sea breeze collide with one another. Um, and so the control is in black, the um, shallow marine layers experiments are in orange, the moderately deep are in pink, and the deepest ones are in blue. And so notice we get this increase in vertical motion at the collision time, followed by an increase in total precip mass and an increase in um, rain rate. And notice that we actually have the greatest vertical motion and total precipitation and rain rate for the deepest and the coldest marine layer uh, once again. And so I just want to take uh, a little bit more of a zoom in at this precipitation increase. Um, and so these are, again, cross sections of precipitation mixing ratio while the at the collision time um, over the slope for the simulation that does not have a sea breeze and the simulation that has our essentially our strongest sea breeze, so the coldest and the deepest. And notice that we actually get deep ascent and intense coastal precipitation um, as storms collide with the deepest and the coldest sea breeze, but we only get really shallow ascent and weaker coastal precipitation when no sea breeze is present. We do still have a weak upslope flow, but that's it. Um, and I do wanna just point out that our mixing ratios are sort of emphasized towards higher values just to um, emphasize the difference, differences between these two. And so what processes drive this particular coastal precipitation maximum and why is the maximum greatest for the coldest and deepest sea breezes? So let's first consider an MCS moving down a mountain slope um, without a sea breeze there. Okay, so the convergence at the gust front um, actually is associated with a positive non-hydrostatic inertial pressure perturbation. So a P prime being greater than zero. And that's shown in this cross section here. And so this cross section shows P prime with uh, red being positive, blue being negative. And then the contours actually show vertical acceleration. And so the positive, um, positive vertical acceleration is in the black contour and negative vertical acceleration is in the dashed contours. And these are all relative to basically the gust front, the cold pool leading edge, which is marked by this dashed line here. And essentially the storm is moving from, from left to right. And so we see this you know, um, positive uh, pressure perturbation at the cold pool leading edge. We also see around it you know, contours of positive vertical acceleration, right? So this convergence drives a positive P prime and it actually drives um, an upward acceleration of air parcels, which you would think would be supportive for precipitation, but there's more to the story. And so if we look at cross sections of potential uh, equivalent potential temperature, um, we could do the same for buoyancy. It's just a little bit, um, it's just highlighted a little bit more clearly here. Um, there's buoyancy gradients across the gust front. And actually these gradients and buoyancy across the gust front, right? We have our cold pool here and our, you know, just ambient air out in front. They're actually associated with the generation of horizontal vorticity. And that's shown here. So these are cross sections of horizontal vorticity and, and storm relative winds. And so positive is in red and negative is in blue for horizontal vorticity. Um, and horizontal vorticity is actually always associated with a negative non-hydrostatic potential or inertial potential temperature. Oh my goodness, inertial pressure perturbation. Um, 
which actually you can see down here, right? And so behind the cold pool leading edge associated with uh, basically the baroclinic gradient, we end up getting uh, negative pressure perturbation. And because we have this negative pre pressure perturbation, we end up driving a downward acceleration, which we can see marked by these black dash lines here. And so air parcels that are initially lifted at the gust front encounter this area and they're actually accelerated back downward. And so this leads to less um, and essentially weaker precipitation associated uh, with no sea breeze. Okay, so what happens then if we have a sea breeze? Well, again, if we look at the um, cross sections of P prime and vertical acceleration, we see that, you know, again, we have a high, um, uh, a positive pressure perturbation at the leading edge of the cold pool. And then of course we have vertical acceleration, which is good. Um, but if we look at the cross section of theta E, and so in this case, this is our cold pool and this is our sea breeze, the buoyancy gradient across the gust front is reduced, right? Because once it encounters that cooler air associated with the sea breeze, we have a reduction. And this actually then results in less baroclinically generated not horizontal vorticity and therefore a smaller negative non-hydrostatic inertial pressure perturbation, which you can see behind here, right? So the P prime is much weaker. It's no, no longer those dark blues. And as a result, we get a reduction in the downward acceleration behind the cold pool leading edge. And therefore we get an enhancement, um, or I'm sorry, um, we get continued rising of our air parcels after they're initiated at the gust front. And that is gonna lead to our more intense precipitation um, over the mountain slope. Okay, so within the research and operational communities, um, numerical sea breezes are initiated a variety of different ways. And so I've basically just shown you initiation with this cold block marine layer. Um, so we have actually initiated using three other methods because you know the question obviously arises, will using different initiation methods impact coastal MCS behavior um, in numerical models? And so I'm not talking about the physics, right? The physics are always gonna be the same, but you might see different results when you actually initiate it with a method that's not this cold block. And so, like I said, we tested three other Seabreeze initiation methods that are commonly used throughout the literature. And so the first one that we use um, is a sensible heat flux function. Um, and so we have a sensible heat flux function that begins at 8 a.m. local time. We have tested other times um, and you know, results are obviously similar. And so using this function, there's a maximum in surface sensible heat flux at the top of the mountain. It decreases as you go down the mountain slope. Um, over the land, it's diurnally varying. And we had three different maxima that we chose. We had um, 100 watts per meter squared, 150 watts per meter squared, and 200 watts per meter squared. Over the ocean, it's obviously much less, um, only 10 watts per meter squared, and we kept that value constant, so it's not um, diurnally varying. Um, and like I said, this is actually a, a really common way to initiate sea breezes in the literature. It's used, it's used quite a bit. All these values are actually constrained by the ERA-5 reanalysis, too. Um, so we've also used a surface sensible heat flux function with a latent heat flux function. So basically, you know, same type of equations that we have before, just one per sensible, one per heat latent, and we combine the two. And again, we have the, um, the heat function beginning at 8 a.m. local time, but we have tested other times. And so nothing really changes as far as the sensible heat flux, but for the latent heat flux, our max value is 240 watts per meter squared. Over the ocean, again, the sensible heat flux is the same uh, constant, 10 watts per meter squared, but for a latent heat flux, it's increased to 60 watts per meter squared. And then we've also tested um, the impact of initiating sea breezes using a surface layer and radiation scheme. And so we use the MYN and surface layer scheme, again, beginning at 8 a.m. We've tested other schemes, we've tested other times, um, and that's coupled with you know, long wave and short wave radiation from the RRTMG. And so for these, we just prescribe the surface as a mixed forest. And obviously the water surface is you know, prescribed as a water surface. And so for these, the sensible heat flux is just a function of the difference in potential temperature from the surface and the overlying air. And for the latent heat flux, um, it de it's determined by the um, mixing ratio of the surface and the overlying air. And so when we look at these other three types of ways to initiate a sea breeze, we actually see a coastal precipitation max for the surface layer scheme only. Okay, so these are planned views on the left cross sections on the right of precipitation mixing ratio. Um, they're both taken while the, while the uh, storm is over the mountain slope. So this spans the mountain slope. 
This spans the mountain slope. Um, the upper left is the sensible heat flux function with a thousand watt per meter squared H naught. The upper right is sensible heat flux function with 200 watts per meter squared. The lower left is uh, the sensible plus the latent combined. And then the lower right is the, um, is the surface layer scheme plus radiation experiments. And so if we look at, you know, basically three of the four, um, the coastal precipitation enhancement using a sensible heat flux function is pretty minimal. The enhancement only really occurs when we use a surface layer scheme with radiation. And again, you see that nice increase of precipitation as the storm is moving down, down the mountain slope as it interacts with the uh, sea breeze, which is marked by this magenta contour here. And so why does this actually happen? Well, the cold pool is actually dissipated by the sensible heat flux function. And so for all sensible heat flux or really surface heat flux function experiments, the cold pool dissipates before it even reaches the edge of the uh, mountain um, plateau top and before it reaches the sea breeze front. And so uh, on the lower left is a cross section of equivalent potential temperatures, so theta E. This is over the plateau top. So the storm is still over the plateau top. And this is for an experiment using a surface heat flux function of um, with an H naught of a 200 watts per meter squared. And this here is our cold pool, which note it's quite weak um, and it never makes it to the edge of the plateau. And then on the uh, right hand side is actually sensible heat flux um, magnitude with horizontal distance. So we have the plateau space uh, on the left, the slope space on the right uh, or in the middle and the ocean um, is on the right. And so we get this dissipation in the cold pool due to the continuous heating during the day from the prescribed heat flux function, which we can see here in this panel. And so the orange, the pink, and the blue show the sensible heat flux function magnitude using you know, the three different values that um, I mentioned earlier. And notice that it's just this constant value over the plateau. And so for the surface layer scheme, why do we get CI? Well, it's because the surface actually is interactive and cools as the cold pool passes over. Um, and so this is the red line here. So this red line here shows the um, sensible heat flux magnitude with horizontal distance for an experiment that uses a surface heat flux function, or um, I'm sorry, a surface layer scheme and radiation. And notice at this time, this is when the cold pool passes over. And notice that there is this dip in the heat flux function down to 50 watts per meter squared as it responds to the cold pool. And therefore the surface heat flux into the cold pool is reduced. It does not decay over the plateau top. It successfully moves down the slope, collides with the sea breeze, and therefore we get convective initiation. And so depending on how you initiate your sea breezes in your numerical model, you can actually get a very different answer, which is important to know for prediction. Okay, and finally, I just wanna wrap up by talking about coastal MCSs um, over the Eastern seaboard in a future climate, right? We've done a lot of work looking at processes of these storms um, in the present climate, and we're interested to see, you know, how does their behavior change uh, in the future with the projected warming? And so um, the literature suggests that there's an increase in the number of days that support severe weather events over the Eastern US in a future climate. And so the left side shows um, CMIP-5 ensemble, the right side shows uh, GFDLC-M3 downscaled with WARF, and they both show the change in the number of severe weather days in a future climate. And notice that anywhere we see red here, and basically orange here, there's an increase in the number of days that will support severe weather in a future climate. And a severe weather day is actually just characterized um, as a combination of basically favorable uh, cape and favorable shear, vertical wind shear conditions. However, this only speaks about the environments. Um, from environments alone, we actually don't know the storm scale details. So we don't know if storms will even be able to initiate in this environment. We don't know the storm mode, right, which is going to be related to the hazards. We talked about MCSs, but what if an MCS isn't supported in a future climate um, under, you know, a certain, certain set of conditions? Or what if they're less favorable? Um, it doesn't tell us anything about the intensity or lifetime of the storm. Um, we don't know anything about the coastal storm evolution, right? We know that there's probably going to be changes in the um, offshore marine atmospheric boundary layer that's going to influence changes in the sea breeze. And then we don't know anything about how the storms are going to traverse the mountains. Is it going to be more likely or less likely that they're going to you know, traverse these mountains? 
more likely or less likely that they're going to traverse the coast. Um, and so we don't really know how coastal precipitation is going to end up changing uh, in a future climate associated with these storms. And so to analyze the storm scale dynamics, we're using the pseudo global warming approach, which essentially we use the wharf to simulate individual cases in the present day and in a future climate. And so this is just an example of one of the cases that we're currently working with. And here it's just um, it's just actually a next red radar animation of the case. And so we see this discrete propagation of the storm over the Appalachian Mountains. And then we sort of see this weaker offshore um, decay as the storm moves over, over the coast. And so for our present day simulations, we're just gonna initialize um, the wharf with the um, high resolution rapid refresh. For a future climate, we're gonna initialize with you know, the same initial conditions, but we're gonna add a climate variable perturbation. And so these perturbations are calculated by taking the difference between um, the future and historical period of the CMIP, uh, CMIP 6. And so our historical period is actually defined as 2005 to 2014. And we do this for the full ensemble. Um, in the future, we're actually gonna be separating this out, not necessarily looking at the full ensemble, but at, at subsets of the ensemble. And so one of the benefits is that we can systematically quantify changes in storm scale processes, and we can actually evaluate the contributions from each uh, change separately, right? We can actually look at changes due to SST alone. We can look at changes during due to land surface alone. We can look at changes due to maybe just the thermodynamic perturbations or just the kinematic per perturbations that are projected to occur. And so um, basically I want to close by just sharing some really uh, preliminary results that we have on this work. So this is really new, new work that we're doing right now. And so kind of the punchline is um, for this one case that we're looking at, right, that I showed you here, um, we don't see much of a change in coastal precipitation in the mid century. And so these are time series of um, area of composite reflectivity greater than 40 dBZ, so really intense convective storms. The same thing down here is the time series of average rainfall rate for the control simulation, so that's historical, for the mid-century, which is in blue, and for the late century, which is in the red dashed. And how we calculate the area is we follow the MCS. And so the values here of composite reflectivity and the values of rainfall rate are only calculated for the storm and only calculated within this moving box. And so when the storm is over the land areas, that is the early part of our time series. When the storm is over you know, the coastal plain and moving offshore, that is the late part of our time series. So that's kind of the you know, time to space relationship here. And so we see a decrease in precipitation intensity and coverage when the storm is over land for the mid and late century, right? So that would be these times here and these times here. So we definitely see a reduction um, for the late century and there is still a reduction for the mid century. So the storm seems to be less intense in a few climate in the mid century. However, when we look to the point when the storm is sitting over the coast, there is a lot less of a change in precipitation area and especially rainfall rate when the storm is near the coast during the mid-century, right? So the difference between the black line and the blue line here. And actually, if we look at a couple of snapshots, um, there may even be an increase in coastal precipitation intensity for this particular case. And so here are a um, snapshot of uh, precipitation, uh, I'm sorry, composite reflectivity for a storm moving offshore at 1Z in the present day, um, and then 1Z in the mid-century, and then 2Z present day and 2Z in the mid-century. And at 1Z, you know, they're about the same intensity. When you look at 2Z, actually the mid-century storm might be a little bit more intense. Um, this could be in part due to the fact that the storm, the propagation speed might be a little bit slower. Um, so maybe it didn't encounter the sea breeze front or, you know, interact with the sea breeze yet. Um, but that also speaks to the timing of the hazards in a future climate too, if we see that our storms are potentially moving slower. And so in summary, um, just some really high level points, right? Coastal precipitation maxima can happen through a variety of different physical processes. Um, and the physical processes, and then obviously the resulting precipitation patterns vary with the thermodynamic kinematic environment. Um, right, we saw differences between the mid, or I'm sorry, the mid-Atlantic, or yeah, mid-Atlantic and um, the long-lived storms for sea breeze only experiments. Um, and then we see a difference when we look at um, simulations with the presence or the absence of the mountain, right? With the mid-Atlantic environment at the coast that's flat, we get a discrete propagation. Mid-Atlantic environment with uh, mountains, 
we don't. We still see a preset maximum, but we get it in a much different way. And so for any given environment, the magnitudes of the coastal precipitation enhancements are sensitive to obviously the characteristics of the sea breezes and the coastal mountains, right? We saw a lot of increases in precipitation associated with these um, more dense and deeper sea breezes. But I do wanna emphasize that the results here are based on exploration of only really a subset of the observed parameter space. Um, it is quite huge and it takes a while to sort of tackle. Um, so we're continuing to perform numerical experiments um, and analyzing observations of cases that we can find um, to understand the behavior of these storms um, as they move over the coastal environments. And so with that, I will stop, say thank you and take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Dr. Lombardo. So we can open for questions now. So if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself or raise your hands and I will unmute you. Uh, or if you don't have a microphone, you can put it in the chat and I will read it out loud. I did get a chat question a, a little while back, so I'll, I'll start us off with that. What kind of observation methods, particularly satellite based, can we use to better observe the heterogeneities of deep convection storms over coastal regions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, any sort of higher resolution you can have as far as looking at um, not just, you know, visible IR, but, you know, any, if you can get any sort of um, increase in resolution when you look at the precipitation habits, essentially. Um, but one thing that is very promising are actually um, radio occultation satellites where you can look at changes in the thermodynamics um, across the coastal environment, right? And so part of the problem in observations is that we don't really have much over the ocean. They're, you know, really targeted for specific, specific um, you know, field campaigns or whatnot, but, you know, they're not regularly taken because of obviously, because it's over the ocean and it's hard, but um, if we can get good boundary layer observations over the water and, you know, tropospheric deep observations over the water, that would really help advance the, the science. Great, oh, thank person. you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you, this is Anqing Li. Uh, my question is about, um, you know, the coastal zone region is a place where many cities, especially big cities like New York, Washington, LA, et cetera. So have you looked at the joint effect of uh, urbanization and coastal sea breeze, uh, you know, effect on the MCS? So the role of the cities would be to modify um, the sea breezes. So you're, you're definitely right there. So as far as the storm dynamics, they're definitely going to sort of take um, prominent role and they won't necessarily um, feel much of the influence of the cities. There has been some work done, um, you know, the, the influence of cities on MCS evolution, but, you know, the jury is still kind of out on how it influences storms, um, you know, heat island, you can say, you know, could actually end up enhancing convection and then the aerosol effect actually could have the opposite. Um, but if the city has actually changed the way the sea breeze circulation is happening, then that actually would have a very real effect on how the MCS would then respond. Mm -hmm. Of course, sea, sea breeze is just uh, responds to many physical dynamical factors, uh, the joint effect. But uh, what about the surface uh, flux? Uh, effect. So um, the surface flux, that's a good question. I have not looked at the influence of the city surface flux. Um, we've only done these sort of uniform surface fluxes, but yeah, you can, um, that would be something we could actually look at it in the future, right? Have these sort of localized hotspots and surface fluxes, um, differences in, you know, sensible and latent and see if it has any impact on the storm. I think it's a really good idea. Thank you. Hi, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Hi, uh, this is, let me see if I can get my camera on. Um, but uh, hi, this is Will Meller uh, from Essex. A really interesting talk. Um, I, I had actually a quick question and also a comment too. Um, my comment actually is I grew up in Virginia, um, just east of the Blue Ridge. And from my own experience, uh, I've just been fascinated by watching the um, whether or not MCS is coming over the Appalachians, um, make it across, and in some cases, actually intensify. And just based on my own observations, this is uh, not not any research, but I've noticed that whether or not these systems survive or even re-intensify around uh, just east of the Blue Ridge is very sensitive to the Cape. 
and in higher cape, high dew point scenarios, those, um, those systems have a much easier time uh, making it over the mountains. And so um, I imagine that's probably a parameter that you, you, your group will probably look at as well in some sensitivity testing. Yeah, and so actually there's been work done by Matt Parker looking at exactly that. So what environment sections support the crossing of MCSs across the Appalachian terrain? Um, and so he's actually done work uh, with environmental sounding, soundings and then also with um, numerical modeling. And so CAPE was important. Um, and then actually in the lower CAPE environments, where vertical wind shear actually became very important. And that actually was um, the kind of determiner, the delimiter between um, MCSs that did or did not cross the mountains successfully. Oh, wow. That's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at his papers. Yeah, that's very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah, and my question actually was uh, from your example on the, um, the terrain case where there was no sea breeze and you um, showed the, the schematic discussing the, um, the baroclinically generated horizontal um, vorticity. And I was just curious, did you look at the sensitivity of that to the terrain slope or terrain height and what kind of effects that terrain would have on that? So actually that's what we're in the process of doing right now. <laughs> okay. And so my postdoc is hard at work now. Actually, we're working on um, writing up that paper currently. And so we're, the thing is that we're conflating two things. And so we're only changing the height of the plateau top, which changes the slope because we're constraining the distance between, you know, the beginning of the plateau slope and the ending of the plateau slope. And so we are actually changing the slope of the plateau by changing the height, but the storm is actually starting off in a very different environment. Um, we are trying to constrain that actually by uh, actually just releasing um, a cold pool with no storm, basically just a cold blob and putting that down the mountain. And those, um, those uh, processes and that research actually is, is ongoing right now. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. They're very cool. I'll look forward to reading that later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? You can chat or raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Oh, go ahead, um, Tino. Hi, Kelly and Tino from uh, Italy. Where, where, How are uh, you? <laughs> fine, thanks. We, we are in the perfect uh, place where mountain slope meet the sea breeze. Yes. So you, have, you have studied. I was just wondering, uh, you have shown a lot of mechanisms uh, where uh, the cold pool or interaction with sea breeze or with the topography creates new CI. And, and uh, my idea is that there are much more CI generated by pre-existing convection than we, we think. Uh, so um, I'm wondering if we should try to start to study only the first CI, the, the CI when there is no convection at all. And, and yes. because only these are the, the generated by triggering mechanism completely different. Because when they start, if the environmental is favorable, you will have a lot of um, different mechanisms to produce new CI that involves uh, this first convection. I, I think we should try to focus on the very first convection and very first CI and mechanisms that generate them. Yes, and not to study everything agree. together. You know, when, when you study the environmental condition, you are taking all the storms together. I, I am starting to think that we should try to to split the the study of the first CI and, and the other that are generated by convection after that it is first started. Yeah, that's a really good idea, um, and that's a really good point. Um, and so actually one of my students that just came on, a master's student just came on, um, she's actually trying to create a sea breeze climatology. Um, it's Eastern US because we're using the next red radar reflectivity. Um, and the first step is just to get a climatology and sort of look at the different characteristics along the Eastern seaboard, but it's directly related to um, basically CI at the coast. Also the things we've talked about here today, but no, you're right, CI, initial CI at the coast is is important, is very, very important as well. And quite different than, yeah, what, hey, what we're talking about this, today. this is the point, yeah. they are different. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good to see you. Nice. Thank you, do we have any other questions before we wrap up?
Okay. Well, unless someone interrupts me, which feel free to do that. Um, I think this is the end of our seminar today. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, and thank you, Dr. Lombardo for giving us this talk. This was great. And it will also um, be on our YouTube channel later this week, probably in a couple of days. Um, so, yeah, thanks everybody for supporting our seminar series this semester. Please, I'm going to put it in the chat 1 more time. Um, go.umde.edu slash seminar feedback. Please tell us what we can do better. So, thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, professor. Uh, we'll send you the video recording uh, once we retrieve it. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Thanks.